Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Karen Carpenter's velvet voice charmed millions in the 70s, but behind the wholesome image she was in turmoil. Desperate to look slim on stage and above all desperate to please the domineering mother who preferred her brother, she became the first celebrity victim of anorexia. Why was Karen Carpenter's anorexia caused by her domineering mother? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Karen Carpenter's Tragic Story The real reason Karen Carpenter was driven to anorexia. Karen Carpenter had unarguably one of the most recognisable voices of the 1970s, paired with her partner Richard Carpenter, the Carpenters were the group that everyone knew and loved. However, Karen's eating disorder issues started well before they started performing together, but no one knew. The Carpenters were one of the biggest selling American musical acts of all time. Between 1970 and 1984, brother and sister Richard and Karen Carpenter had 17 top 20 hits, including Goodbye to Love, Yesterday Once More, Close to You and Rainy Days and Mondays. They notched up 10 gold singles, 9 gold albums, 1 multi-platinum album and 3 Grammy Awards. Karen's velvety voice and Richard's airy melodies and meticulously crafted arrangements stood in direct contrast to the louder, wilder rock dominating the rest of the charts at the time, yet they became immensely popular, selling more than a 100 million records. Richard was the musical driving force, but it was Karen's effortless voice that lay behind the Carpenters' hits. Promoted from behind the drums to star vocalist, she became one of the decade's most instantly recognisable female singers. But there was a tragic discrepancy between her public and private selves. Off stage, away from the spotlight, she felt desperately unloved by her mother, Agnes, who favoured Richard and struggled with low self-esteem eventually developing anorexia nervosa, from which she never recovered. She died at the age of 32. If anorexia has classically been defined as a young woman's struggle for control, then Karen was a prime candidate, for the two things she valued most in the world, her voice and her mother's love, were exclusively the property of her brother Richard. At least she would control the size of her own body. And control it she did, by 1975, her weight fell to 6 stone 7 pounds, 41 kilograms. Karen Carpenter was the instantly recognisable smooth voice of the wholesome 1970s brother-sister band. She was just 32 years old at the time of her passing, truly a tragic day for her many fans and family. In those days, eating disorders like anorexia were little heard of and even less understood. For years, biographers and filmmakers tried to tell the Karen Carpenter story, but were thwarted by a family who were both grieving the loss of their daughter and very controlling about how they were viewed. Born on March 2nd, 1950 to Harold Bertram Carpenter and Agnes Ruer in New Haven, Connecticut, Karen Carpenter was one half of the hit 70s pop duo with her brother Richard. The Carpenter family moved to Downey, California in 1963, and it was there that Karen began to explore an interest in music. She took up an instrument in high school as a way of dodging gym class. I couldn't stand track at 8am or a cold pool, so they put me in the band and gave me a glockenspiel. She joined the school band at Downey High School in 1964. She was given a chance to play the glockenspiel by Bruce Gifford, her conductor but she didn't like playing glockenspiel and later took up drumming after getting inspired by her friend Frankie Chavez's drumming skills. From a young age, Richard Carpenter became interested in music. He began hating the rigidity of piano lessons and taught himself to play by ear. Karen, four years his junior, convinced her parents into buying her a $300 Ludwig drum set and started receiving training from Frankie Chavez. Being a quick learner, she picked up the art of drumming in no time and was able to play some very difficult time signatures like the 5-4 in Dave Brubeck's Take 5. They both began messing around with various bands until they decided to join forces in 1965 as the Richard Carpenter Trio, 
Within a few years they would record hit songs, but what was their relationship like behind the scenes? When Karen graduated from Downey High School in 1967, she was 17 years old, a year younger than the rest of her classmates. At a time in her life when body image was everything, Karen began dieting. Karen's quest to be thin seems to have begun innocently enough when she started the Stillman Water Diet. Although she was never obese, she was what most would consider a chubby 17-year-old at 10 stone 5 pounds. She was 5 foot 4 inches tall. She levelled off at around 8 stone 8 pounds and maintained her weight by eating sensibly, but not starving herself. Even so, eating while on tour was problematic for Karen, as she described in 1973. When you're on the road, it's hard to eat, period. On top of that, it's rough to eat well. We don't like to eat before a show because I can't stand singing with a full stomach. You never get to dinner until, like, midnight, and if you eat heavy, you're not going to sleep and you're going to be a balloon. After high school, Karen started the diet which focuses on lean meats and a minimum of eight glasses of water per day. The diet helped her get down to a healthy looking 120 pounds. The stunning carpenter was ready for the big time. After her graduation, she enrolled at the California State University, Long Beach. There she performed for the college choir along with her brother, Impressed by her voice, Frank Pooler, the choir's director, gave her lessons in singing and helped her develop a three-octave range. Richard may have been the revolutionary creative mind behind the group, but Karen actually secured a recording contract before her brother. She was 16 when she got her big break, even though the contract soon fell through. The duo's biggest crowd was made up of approximately 50,000 people, but they weren't performing in a stadium or arena. This 1971 concert was actually at the Ohio State Fair, and they performed for one night only. Karen's voice was often criticised for being too soft during the 1970s rock and roll craze, but critics have since changed their tune. The UK Rolling Stone magazine once stated that Karen was one of the best singers of all time. She had been a chubby teenager, and in 1973 she saw a photo of herself that prompted her to take action. She hired a personal trainer who made visits to her home and recommended a diet low in calories but high in carbohydrates. Instead of slimming down as she had hoped, Karen started to put on muscle and bulk up. She lost 20 pounds and looked fabulous, said a sister of an old boyfriend, but unfortunately she didn't stop there. She fired her trainer and immediately set out on a mission to shed the unwanted pounds on her own. She purchased a hip cycle, which she used each morning on her bed, and because it was portable, the equipment was packed and taken with her on tour. Her manager, Sherwin Bash, was horrified when he saw her new skeletal body. She hid by day beneath multiple layers of blouses and jumpers, but at night, when she took to the stage in low-cut slinky gowns, there was often a collective intake of breath from her fans. They thought she was dying of cancer. We reveal the emotional problems at the core of Karen's eating disorder. Karen was deprived of her mother's affection at a young age due to her mother's apparent inability to love. By then it was clear that her older brother Richard was a piano prodigy. It was also clear that he was their mother's favourite child. Carpenter's struggle with eating disorders, she was afflicted with bulimia as well as anorexia, was in part a direct response to knowing that her mother Agnes didn't really love her. Not like she loved Richard anyway. Carpenter couldn't control her mother's affections, but she could control her food intake. Karen was adored by millions. Her circle of friends loved her dearly, but it was her mother's love she never received. At Karen's worst, her family insisted she had no emotional problems and that her over-dieting was something they could sort out by themselves. Agnes was more concerned with outward appearances than she was with Karen's mental health. In a therapy session following Karen's first hospitalisation for anorexia, the therapist asked Karen's family to tell her they loved her. Her father and brother did so readily. Agnes, on the other hand, dodged the request and chastised the therapist for referring to her by her first name, a habit she considered gauche. Friends were at a loss what to do. 
Karen was always a strong character when it came to getting others to face up to their problems, not least when her brother Richard suffered a Qualudes addiction. But she refused to admit that her weight loss was anything more than stress-related. At restaurants, Karen pushed her food around her plate or urged her friends at the table to try her meal, stealthily getting rid of her food whilst giving the impression she was enjoying her meal so much she wanted others to try it too. Anorexia was a new disease and certainly not one with the high profile it has today. People were not aware of how to deal with it. They thought it could be cured by eating. Sherwin Bash also confronted Karen's parents about her weight, but they again took the stance that it was private family business. They thought psychiatrists were for crazy people. A lot of us girls in that era went through moments of that. Everybody wanted to be twiggy. Karen got carried away. She just couldn't stop. Having witnessed Karen's meticulous routine of counting calories and planning food intake for every meal, Richard complimented her initial weight loss during a break from recording as the two dined at the Eau Petit Café, a favourite French bistro on Vine Street near the A&M Studios. You look great, he told her. Well, I'm just going to get down to around 105. 105? You look great now. Karen's response worried Richard. In fact, this was the first time he paused to consider she might be taking the diet too far. Friends and family began to notice extreme changes in Karen's eating habits, despite her attempts at subtlety. She rearranged and pushed her food around the plate with a fork as she talked, which gave the appearance of eating. Here, you have some, she would say as she enthusiastically scooped heaps onto others' plates. Would you like to taste this? By the time dinner was over, Karen's plate was clean, but she had dispersed her entire meal to everyone else. Her mother Agnes caught on to this play and began to do the same in return. Well, this is good too, she would say as she put more food on her daughter's plate. This infuriated Karen, who realised she would have to find other ways to avoid eating. Eventually Karen did receive treatment for her condition, but she only found new ways to lose more weight. She discovered and utilised laxatives, taking 80 to 90 tablets a night. She additionally was on unprescribed thyroid medication to speed up her metabolism. Once Karen began experiencing complications from her condition, she was admitted to the hospital where she ultimately gained some weight back. However, this was not enough to save her and her body was simply defeated from the years of self-harm. Although Karen seemed dedicated to getting well, she continued to vigorously exercise to work off calories or force herself to throw up. In 1982, she started to lose weight again and became severely dehydrated. Karen ultimately had to be admitted to Lenox Hill Hospital, where she was placed on an intravenous drip. While this treatment did help her and Karen was ultimately able to get herself up to 110 pounds, her heart was under a great deal of strain. On February 1st, 1983, at the age of 32, Karen Carpenter collapsed and died in her bedroom at her parents' house. Her heart simply gave out. According to the autopsy, there was no indication of a drug overdose. Still, there was evidence that her dependence on the vomit-inducing drug Ipecac was the primary contributor to her heart failure, along with the physical toll that anorexia took on her body. Most of the people in Carpenter's support system thought she simply needed to consume more calories. No one understood that she was suffering from a very real disorder. Her bandmate John Bettis admitted that he didn't even know how to pronounce anorexia until Carpenter had been suffering from it for five years, and that her issues with food came down not to weight but to control. I have no doubt she was a tortured soul, says one family friend of Karen who sadly became Anorexia's first ever poster girl. Carpenter grew up desperate for the affections of an indifferent mother, and her career as a singer was steered by her domineering older brother. Anorexia was a way for her to exercise control over her own affairs, but because both medical and mental health professionals didn't know how eating disorders worked, it took longer than it should have for Carpenter to get the help she needed. By the time she did receive proper treatment, it was too late. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, 
please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the secret surrounding Karen Carpenter's eating disorder? Leave your thoughts and share this video with your friends too.